Hello, guys. Can, can you hear me well? Everything is going smooth. Thank you guys for being here. I'm super excited. I really love to be here. Uh, as you already heard before. So I'm Felipe Duarte. I'm currently a Threat Research Lead at Security Joe's. Uh, you can follow me in Twitter as Dark Opcodes, as in the slide. And today we are going to talk about some topic that's actually very interesting for us when we were uh, actually responding some, to some incidents uh, during this year. And it's about a worm that is called Raspberry Rowing. So we're going to talk about some of the interesting uh, artifacts and the techniques that this worm is using to actually deceive us as defenders. So it's kind of a, a very, when, when I first saw this, was like, oh my god, uh, it was very, very interesting. So I really want to pass that message to you. So hopefully we are going to get to that point. So. Let's go into the topic. First, who am I? So I told you uh, that I'm a trade research lead at Security Joe's. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. One of the things that I love, malware. The second one, to share everything that I learned in malware analysis with you. So uh, I also love about Python, but most of the time, I have been focused all my work in malware analysis. So to actually get into the mood of the talk, uh, I really wanted to have this quotation here, which is, if you know your enemy and know yourself, you don't need to fear the result of 100 battles. This is from Sun Tzu. And why it is important? Because we here in the, in the cybersecurity uh, field, we are always in a battle, right? And we know. Uh, we have an enemy, we need to study to actually understand what they do and to defend ourselves from them. But there is a catch here. Even we as defenders, actually we understand the enemy, but we are their enemy. So they actually, they are going to understand us too. So we need to be careful. This is a two-way uh, battle, so that's why this is very interesting to have here. So first, I was talking about battles, enemies. So who is our enemy today? Our enemy is a worm called Raspberry Rowan. So it's a very complex worm, even though it's, uh, we have seen this worm just, uh, it's not like very new. But what is actually, like what captures our, our attention is how complex it is, the amount of techniques that it uses to distribute different malware. Uh, Variants. Okay, so this is more like a distribution botnet that uses different techniques. It's very robust and it has like a very it, it, like it drills very specifically on some filtering capabilities. So we are going to talk about more into into that later. But basically, what it allows attackers or threat actors is to identify which are the actually valuable the actual valuable assets and. A, also maintain like a very stealthy um, operation. And also, they added a lot of, but a lot of stuff that protects us, protects the, the, actually protect the code from being analyzed, okay? So, <coughs> one of the, like, like talking about the features of this tool, uh, it has very different distribution mechanisms. Uh, it also has, uh, it tries to abuse different trusted cloud services such as GitHub, uh, Azure, and also uh, Discord to distribute payloads. Uh, <laughs> it implements a lot of uh, obfuscation. We're going to get into each of these topics. It has a lot of anti-VM, anti-analysis techniques. Uh, also has, and this is one of the most important uh, features, it has like a secure payload distribution based on the analyst deception. So what they want is they want to make you believe you understood it, and they are going to give you just kind of a, a small candy for you, just to say, yeah, you did it. But at the end of the day, you didn't go to the actual payload. So this is one of the most notorious things. We are going to talk into that later. And finally, all its communication is done via Tor network. 
So <coughs> let's talk about the first item, which is the distribution. So the distribution, one of the main mechanisms that it's, this tool uses is uh, LNK files that are usually found in USB drives. Okay, so this is one of the main mechanisms that it uses. Usually you see these kind of LNK files inside the USB, so you connect the USB. A, a, a command line is executed, which is that one, CMD, pointed to a, an MSI executable, and an URL. So when you see that, that line, what it basically says to Windows is go to this URL and download that MSI. That MSI is then downloaded from usually a uh, kind of server that is a compromised QNAP device. So they actually uh, build all its backend on top of QNAP devices. Once this uh, MSI is downloaded, it's executed, and finally a DLL is uh, loaded into the system. So this is one of the main mechanisms, this, the distribution, as I told you. If it goes with LNK files, it's because a, 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 a USB that was infected, and those USB are usual, usually infected when um, you plug, uh, you connect a, a USB to an infected device. Okay, so this is one of the uh, mechanisms that it use. It's actually very uh, complicated to try to to handle this kind of distribution because it's outside of any. Uh, it doesn't require any actual server. Okay. But this is one of the of those. In this case, for example, this is one of the MSIs that we got. If you see the actual, the actual metadata of that um, MSI, is kind of weird. So, so the manufacturer it has like random letters. Also, the size sometimes is huge. Just to um, try to prevent you to upload the sample to different uh, online scanners, okay? So that's one of the main the distributions. The second one is related to seed files. This is more related to advertisement, malware uh, in advertisements. That was one of the cases that we saw. So you get a seed file. This seed file contains usually a Java script, which is encrypted by micro... Uh, so it's not a just a JavaScript, it's a JSE -A script, which means it was um, like encrypted using the, um, the Microsoft uh, technology just to do this encryption. Uh, <coughs> and finally, it drops a DLL that also is the, the loaded. Okay, in this case, when you see this kind of distribution, the command line is different. In this case, they are using Rec Server 32 pointing to a drop DLL that is located in the temp folder. So in this case, this usually is related to, as I told you, malvertisement, but it's also a very frequent uh, distribution mechanism for this one. Uh, <coughs> this is one of the examples when you See, this kind of uh, files, so this is the content of the GSC file. As you see, it's totally encrypted, but if you see there is a reference, there is a, G, a JSE decoder. It's uh, in, in that GitHub, actually, you can get the code, you compile it, and you can actually get the payload. Uh, that is the, the actual by, um, script that is going to be executed. One important, thing, uh, one important thing is that this kind of encryption is also used by other Trojans, such as Catbox, for example. In the latest attacks that Catbox, they are actually moving into this direction, which is encrypting all the content of the scripts. So <coughs> talking about distributions, as I told you, we have two. The first distribution, USBs. The second one, malvertisement. OK, <coughs> moving now to the content providers. So they try to use, uh, as other threat actors have done, so they try to deploy these kind of payloads using Discord. Also, they, uh, they have accounts in Azure and also in GitHub. One example of this, and this is how actually you, you see the, the redirection. 
uh, in one of the cases that we were uh, uh, investigating, we saw, for example, the first uh, indicator, the first URL, was just a redirection to a malvertisement campaign. So the domain adbisonredirect is actually a domain that you use to track advertisements. And uh, the thing here was that, in this case, the trade actors were using that uh, specific service to deploy the um, payload which was uh, hosted in Discord, okay? One important thing, they actually, and this is something very notorious in this kind of threat actors, they really like the, the um, I, like they, they really want to get telemetry from their at attacks. And this, one of, this was one of the, of the main things that we, we saw. So for example, in this case, they deployed the, the campaign, the malvertisement campaign, but actually they were getting um, telemetry from that campaign using that service. So they are not just sending attacks, they also really want to see how good they are, go they are doing. So <coughs> uh, the third part, we then go to a code obfuscation. So this is also one of the most interesting things when you, when you talk about uh, Raspberry Robin. So <coughs> they actually use a lot, but a lot of obfuscation. One of those obfuscations uh, techniques, first, you will see uh, uh, multiple la layers of shell code and packers. So it's kind of crazy to analyze a binary in which you have at least, at least eight layers of different packing and shell codes and all of them are being used like in an order. It's kind of crazy the amount of effort that these guys are actually adding. The second one is they are using some methods such as the indirect calls using the stacks. We will see that later on a small example. Third one, they add a lot of useless instructions. So that's the case in this uh, screen. If you see, there are a, lot, a bunch of really bunch of instructions, all of them, they don't, they don't do anything. <coughs> Basically, what they do is they add a lot of instru instructions, but in the middle of them, they add, the, the, some of them are, are, are the ones that are required. But, I mean, when you start analyzing it, it's massive. And you, you just see that and say, what the hell happened here? So it's kind of crazy. The third one is um, <coughs> they use obfuscation, uh, they, they obfuscate the control flow using a, a finite state machine. So basically what they want, they want to avoid the need or using like a, a very plain uh, control flow. Instead, they, <coughs> at the beginning of some, uh, some specific layers, they added um, like a set of values that are going to define the behavior of the, F, uh, the FSM. So this is kind of the most difficult part. And to, to be honest, this, when you, uh, when you see this, actually, it's kind of crazy. So I try to skip that part. And when I'm dealing with this kind of uh, analysis, I mainly focus on the, the APIs that, that these guys use. But I mean, that means from a technical perspective, when you want to do a static analysis of this kind of sample, the result is that it's not simple. It's not something that you are going to see, ah, no, it's simple, it's, it's easy. No, to be honest, it's actually very complicated. So this is uh, one example for, uh, for the way that they are using the stack to pass, um, like to do indirect, indirect calls. In this example, for, uh, you see that in <coughs> there is a line which it says push ECX. What, it, what they did there, they are pushing in ECX, it's, it's the address of the shell code that they are, going, they are going to load. Then you have push EAX, which contains the address of the main DLL. And then they have a jump. And that jump is uh, actually pointing to the location of the Windows API virtual free. So the first time that I was analyzing that, it was curious because I thought uh, the jump was going into the virtual free and then when I came back, 
I was into the shell code. So I was like, wait, 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 what happened? What happened here? So it's kind of crazy. Then I have to take more time. More time and yeah, actually what they are doing, they are changing when they push the ECX value, uh, which is the shell code address, what they are doing, they are changing the return instruction. So they, it's, very it's very clever because what they are doing is they push the address to, we to where they want to come back, but also they are cleaning the code that they already use. So at the, with those three instructions, the end result is you are jumping to a shell code but you are deleting the DLL that was already done. So if you see from a, like from a technical perspective what happened here, they want to execute their code, but in the stealthy mode, I, I, I mean, as quiet as possible. So this is one of the examples of the kind of obfuscation that you can see in those samples. So it's very, very interesting. <coughs> Talking about anti-VN and anti-analysis, there are a lot also. One of the checks that they also uh, do, usually they, uh, they do some change, uh, sorry. They do some checks of the PEB uh, of the software. So the PEB is a structure that contains all <coughs> the information that Windows requires to track related to uh, an, the execution of, a, of, a, of binary. In this case, for example, in the PEV, you can, uh, you can find uh, information about if a system is being debu uh, debugged or not, which are the flags that Windows uses when the, system, when the binary is being executed or the process is, is, is executed. So this is one of the things that they, they use, which is also frequent to find in, in additional um, malware. Also, they do validations related to the username and computer name. This is very interesting. Why? Because they have a list inside the binary, and they actually compare the name of the machine that is currently uh, uh, executing the, the malware to this uh, actually to the list to this hard coded list. So. <coughs> Now, in order to this, for this method to work, they actually need to take, uh, to, to update, to constantly update the binaries and update the name, uh, uh, the usernames and the computer names that are like working. This, the third uh, mechanism that they use is the, they also check the process name, the file paths, looking for possible names that are used by sandboxing environments or like sample uh, sample one that uh, or, or like names containing sample or uh, things like that uh, they also look for the information of the processor uh, they also look for the product id of the physical uh, disk and uh, that's kind of, there are a few more tricks that they use but this is kind of the the idea but there is one, uh, one, one, one interesting thing with, with this. All these checks are only done for a reason. And that reason is actually deceiving, deceiving us or as analysts. So, and this, we, here we, we come to, the, to one of the most important uh, items of why we consider this is a very interesting attack to analyze. By far the most interesting technique that they employed is that they want to deploy fake payloads into the machines of the analysts or the sandboxing environments. So usually, when you, you are analyzing a malware, the, the main logic of that analysis is if there is an uh, like if the malware found that it is a sandboxing environment, stop execution. So for you as an analyst. If you see that there is a sample and suddenly it is a stop execution, so it's weird. So you are going to continue doing the analysis because something is weird. Something it doesn't make any sense. If you found something in one machine, it was doing so, uh, like a lot of connections to the network, and when you take to your VM, suddenly it didn't do anything. So that captures our attention. However, in this case, it's very curious that they actually 
the, if they capture, they identify that it is, it is running in a sandboxing or in an analyst machine, they are going to provide a payload. Yeah, in fact, it will get a payload, it will contact a C2 server, but the difference is the behavior is not the real one. The behavior that you are going to see is just an AdWare downloader, which is kind of crazy because at the end you get reports from the sandboxing uh, devices or platforms, and those sandboxing says, like, yeah, it captures a file, it downloads a file, executes a file, uh, it's a downloader, uh, this is the C2 server, but in fact, it wasn't the real one. It was just something that they added to deceive you. And this is something that is not so common to find. Usually, when you start analyzing malware and crime word distributions, you see that either they deploy something or not. They block, they block you completely or not. But in this case, they are just playing with you. So that's, that's very, very curious. So let's talk a little bit about this fake payload. So when you start doing the analysis of the file, and at some point <coughs> you miss one of the... Um, or you are detected by any of the anti-analysis and anti-EN uh, techniques, you are going to get into a code. These are some of the pieces of code of this fake payload. So the first part of the code, which is this one, is just identification. If you see, <coughs> they are getting, uh, there are some reference to the username, and at the, in, in the bottom um, is the image or picture, you will see that they are using the uh, Windows API and on display devices. So they are just getting a file of the machine. Okay? So that's the first part of the fake payload. When it is running, <coughs> it will get a profile of your uh, system, the system that is currently executing the malware. Then, if you see, there is a hard coded C2 server. This C2 server is a, another QNAP device, so it matches with the profile of the threat. And to this, div uh, to the, to this C2 server, there is going to be a request. The request is encrypted with RC4. It has, <coughs> like, a, a, when you see the traffic, it looks like a C2 server. So you think, yeah, this is a C2 server. But the thing here is that all the, all the information of the analyst machine is sent to the C2 server. And at the end, <coughs> if you see, uh, you are going to get, in the last part, a file, and this file is going to be executed. So from an analyst perspective, if you are resp responding to an, uh, to an incident, you are in a hurry, you are doing a, um, a quick triage, you run this in a sandbox, you are going to see, OK, it captures all the information, of, uh, like the profile of the machine, it sends that to the C2 server, good, and then you are getting a payload. I mean, that's malware. OK, it's good. Let's continue. Let's fill the report. That's it. But <coughs> the thing here is that's not the, the, the real thing. So <coughs> uh, I wanted to, to uh, create this small um, diagram to let you know what's the mindset of these guys. So first, you start with a, with a Raspberry Robin loader, which is a, D, which is a DDL, a D, DLL, sorry. At some point, <coughs> it, will be, it will run all the different checks uh, to identify if your machine is an analysis machine or is a real machine. So this is one of the most important, one of the strongest things that this uh, thread has. Uh, it's, and this is one of the filtering capabilities that I was telling you about. So when it, it does this question, if it is no, if, if it doesn't find, find like any new, um, any analysis environment, it will run the real payload. So what's the real payload? Uh, basically, <coughs> it will deploy a uh, uh, like a module inside the, the machine that is going to contact to a C2 server using Tor nodes. So all the traffic will be over Tor network. And from Tor, it will get additional content. So it could be like shell code that will be executed, but also it can, de uh, it can deploy additional malware. So 
What kind of malware have been related to this? ICID is one of those. TrueBot is another one. And at some case, it, at some point, or in some cases, it's a club ransomware. So it's kind of interesting because the, the behavior itself is really bad. And the profit, which <coughs> this, this, uh, the profile of this um, trade actor looks very similar to the other attack that is called Sotgolish. So they really want to get to get into uh, an environment, guarantee that that environment makes sense to be infected. So it's it's a valid target, and then they want to use that as an entry point for different, like uh, to be access uh, to sell the access, so like to be access brokers. That that is kind of the real uh, scenario. If it finds that uh, it is not being executed in an analysis environment. But what, ha what happens if it catch you? If it catch you, it will run another payload. So it told you that pay this payload is fake. <coughs> this payload is going to get all the details of your machine. Okay? These details will be sent to the C2 server. And what they can do? they can improve their methods because they got telemetry from your devices. What telemetry? They got what, are, what is the username that you were using. They, were, they got what is the uh, size, the amount of processors. So they can basically <coughs> improve the rules that they are using to catch the different uh, devices or analysis environments. And actually, it, it works very well. <coughs> Because, for example, uh, in the previous year, this uh, researcher, uh, Herman, which is a friend of, me, of mine, uh, uh, actually, he submitted a sample, one of these samples, to Joe, uh, Joe Sandbox. And <coughs> according to Joe Sandbox, it actually was a malicious uh, <coughs> sample. So uh, the Sandbox he actually um, classified this, this malware like, like good. But the thing here, if, this, if you see the C2 server, the C2 server is the C2 server of the fake payload. That means if the sample was run in that environment uh, with internet, so the, um, the trade actors have already this, the profile of the Joe Sandbox in their telemetry. So, it's very, very clever the way they are doing, and this is a change in the, in the way trade actors work. Because almost all the time, uh, so you see that probably trade actors are aware of researchers studying them, but they didn't like, create a complete pipeline, automatic pipeline that is getting the information, sending the information back to them to understand who is analyzing them. So it's kind of very, it looks like there is a, like a product owner behind saying like, okay guys, what if we add this new cool feature? So that was like the, what, what is going on with the, these guys. So <coughs> uh, be aware, uh, this is something that actually is, is happening. And <coughs> to be honest, and this, is, this was one of the main reasons why we choose this topic. When I started analyzing this, I fall more than five times into this stupid fake payload because I couldn't, I, I mean, I, I saw just the, the IP, I saw everything, I got the shell code. It was not, not simple to get the payload. So when you first see this, this kind of behavior, you think, okay, I got it. I got it right. I did it. But it was all a lie. Okay, so be aware these situations happen. And uh, we need to, uh, as we are, like, this is uh, the, the, the gain of the, the mouse and the cat. We are trying to catch them, but they are always creating a new method. And, a new, and the thing here is also that it's a, a cool method. <coughs> Also, <coughs> all the traffic, as I told you before, uh, all the communications, the real communications that this uh, thread does uh, are running in Tor. So the, the real configuration of the, of the um, malware 
once you actually get to, to the real payload, this configuration uh, is <coughs> stored in the, in, the, in the actual binary. And to these servers, a, a real profile of the machine is sent. And from these servers, a, additional commands and also additional um, modules or, ch or, or code is the, uh, is downloaded to be executed. Okay, uh, in the profile that is sent to these to, uh, to these devices to these servers, usually we find information such as the Windows version, the system uh, information like the drive, the serial of the of the um, drive, the information about the display, also the software that is installed, uh, and uh, an additional information about the user. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> so, what is what is imp imp important, uh, at least from a from a defense perspective, is uh, we need to understand them. We need to define a, a set of ways to catch them. If you are running threat hunting, for example, <coughs> I advise you to try to look for these commands. So, if any command that is using like MSA, MSI exec and is pointing to a URL, please try to, to be very, um, to do a, a, a more uh, in depth so, uh, research because <coughs> basically this command line is telling uh, Windows to uh, execute MSI to fetch, to download an uh, MSI file from the URL. As I told you, this is usually the behavior of the, the worm when it's being spread using USB devices. So this is a command line that you should be aware of. So try to look for that in your, thread, in, in your daily threat hunting activities. Uh, also, <coughs> another one is this one. So rec server 32 pointing to a, a file in the temp folder. The file usually <coughs> is a file without extension, doesn't uh, have the, it, it should be like a DLL, but it doesn't have any extension. So please, this is other indicator that help, could help you to, to actually uh, detect this threat in your environment. The, <coughs> the last one, this command line is the actual command line that is executed if the malware uh, doesn't run in the in the fake mode uh, in the fake payload mode. So <coughs> basically, what they do, they try uh, they start executing additional files, but uh, using a trusted binary such as Rex Server 32. So this technique <coughs> is very notorious in this reductor. So another command line that you should be aware of. Finally. <coughs> Try to monitor closely all the uh, software that is connecting to a Tor network. So going back to the beginning, and this was where I used the, the quotation. Uh, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles, but remember, this applies for us as defenders, but also for them as attackers. So on the other side of the equation, they are trying to get information for you, from you. And we need to be aware of that. You need to understand that <coughs> not everything that you see during an analysis, even if makes sense to you, as I told you, you run the analysis, you get some network traffic to actual C2 servers. The C2 servers, ha the C2 servers have a very specific signature, are QNAP devices. The traffic is encrypted with RC4, so it makes sense. Why an, an, an attacker is going to bother or, or to spend all that time creating that logic if, I, I mean, uh, they build all that, all of that, just to deceive you. So they want all your information. They want to get you know. That is, that is how important we as defenders are, that they took all the time to create the pipeline to do the, the, the analysis, <coughs> not to analyze you. So <coughs> that's, that's one of the, 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 the things that I, that I really want to, to, to share with you. 
Uh, so please be aware. Don't fall into the game. Uh, and don't assume that because it kind of matches what you were expecting, it is the actual behavior. So it's same thing. <coughs> That's one of the, of the key things to, to have in mind. Uh, that's it, guys. So <coughs> I really want to share, uh, wanted to share <coughs> this with you. Uh, if you have questions, please go, and I'm here just to answer your questions. Thank you.